research shows that women if there's a job opening and there are five things unless all five boxes are ticked often women don't apply but men you know have one net box and they usually apply so when women are tapped for opportunities they need to take that opportunity don't hesitate to take the job because of you're not sure you can do it or confidence the way i look at it is if someone taps you on the shoulder you obviously have the skills they think you can do it which means they're already vested in it they're going to support you i think it's asking for when i say asking for help i don't mean to asking for someone to solve your problem i mean a lot of the times i did and other people i work with and then this is my expectation when i work with someone is i will show you how to do it once but i expect you to do the work yourself and come to me for help it is not hand holding and then asking a lot of questions welcome to this new episode of beyond the thesis with papa phd Today, I have the great, great pleasure of having with me Sirisha Kuchimanchi. Sirisha is the founder of Sahita, a global community for South Asian women for career and financial empowerment. She hosts the podcast Women, Career and Life and the radio show Life Beats with Sirisha. Sirisha is a former global engineering and manufacturing executive from Texas Instruments, a Fortune 200 company. She co-chaired the Tech and Manufacturing Women's ERG, with, which supported over 500 employees accorded across three continents and eight countries. Sirisha is an immigrant from India and earned her doctorate in material science and engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. Her aim is to promote gender equality by empowering more women to take control of their careers and finances. Welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD Sirisha. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me here. And I'm really excited to chat. And this is my first LinkedIn Live where I'm sitting on the other side oh, of the mic. <laughs> there we go. It's That's always it. the first time. And uh, I, I hope it's going to be, uh, it's, I'm going to be a, as good a host as you are on your, on your life. Oh, I'm sure. It'd be wonderful. <laughs> uh, Srisha, so I did uh, just present you fairly quickly. Um, can you share a little bit more about you, about uh, your, you know, your journey, your PhD, and and then how you came to to be in this in mission that you are today of empowering women uh, in in being independent financially and and successful in a space that I think uh, you know, traditionally has been very much uh, male dominated. Let's say like engineering and manufacturing. Yeah, it, it, that's true, and. There's quite a few of us. So I'm originally from India. I came to the U- I studied physics in India. My bachelor's and master's is in physics. And I came to graduate school to the US uh, to CMU. And I finished my master's and I started working in, in early 2000s. And I had sort of a meandering path around it. So I got laid off from my first job less than a year into it. So it, it was a sort of transformational experience. Now when I look back, going through it, obviously not. <laughs> it was hard at that point. But as people are going through layoffs now, and there's so much conversation around it, and you know, at that point, uh, people didn't talk about it. There was no LinkedIn, so mm-hmm. now it's much more accepted in a way. And I just want people to know who who are listening to this or who may listen to the recording that, as hard as it may be, and depending on which stage you are, it, it will work out well. It will be a pivotal point, and it gives you time to think. So. Try to realize that the layoff has nothing to do with you. It's 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 the other external circumstances that define it. And for you to look for support in LinkedIn through podcasts and other mediums to have people to support you. Yeah, there's much less. Uh, I feel that there's less uh, taboo around it now than, than there might have had when it happened to you. <laughs> Absolutely. So actually, yes, that was my first podcast episode. Was talking about the layoff. Oh wow. Okay. And okay. That's what we started with. And so I I worked for a few years and then I quit work to be a stay-at-home mom. So I stayed home for three years with my kids. So I had taken a break from my PhD when I started working. And at that point, I chose to go back to graduate school and finish up my thesis when I, when I was staying home. So I finished up my thesis and then a few years later, went back to work for TI. And most of my time, I started working in development you know, and uh, working with client services, working for vendors, for companies, and then moved into essentially largely the factories into manufacturing and engineering. 
So it's it's been a wonderful journey. There's a lot to learn. I think semiconductors now are in the spotlight because of the global landscape. You know, the supply chain constraints, I think last year kind of made people think, oh, there is this thing that, you know, chips other than potato chips, there are other chips that matter to us. So it's it's got a spotlight and the US has, you know, this chip back and this humongous investment in semiconductor industry. There's a lot of companies building factories and stuff. So it's it's a wonderful area to work in because if you think about it, it's products touch everything in our lives. Like there's nobody who doesn't have a semiconductor technology touching their life at any point of time. Yeah, look, today it's true. Uh, in any any little thing that you might have uh, that's not just mechanical, but that's even just electrical and electronics, it's 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 there. And now every everyone has one of these uh, in their pockets. Exactly. And <laughs> there we go. That one, yeah. Oh, yeah. So so, uh, Sadisha, one of the things that you in, you mentioned in passing has a lot to do with what we are talking about today, which is how women can can navigate uh, career transitions and entering these domains, which are not traditionally, you know, which traditionally have more are more associated to men. Uh, and the first thing that you mentioned was I took I stopped my PhD, I I became a mom, I was a stay home mom, and then I went back to my PhD. And this question of parenthood is one of the big ones for women, young women in whichever career journey. Uh, but let's say your know, graduate school, it's five to seven years in this age that might be the age that you want to start a family. Can you talk a little bit about how that went? You know, how did you negotiate and navigate interrupting and then resuming? Because I'm, I'm really, really curious about, you know, what tips and advice you can give to, to other young women out there. Yeah, so when I, I finished my master's and I'd started my PhD work, so I'd done a lot of the research when I was there. But when I found my first uh, job, I moved because my husband had moved. And I started working. I realized I had to take a break because I couldn't continue my thesis work at that point. So when I, you know, this was about five, six years later, all thesis, all PhD programs have sort of a time limit, right? You pass these exams and the exams also have a time and the timer kicks off and it expires. So it was something that I was at the back of my mind wanting to finish. And I knew that the timer was going to kick off. So I ended up, um, my department, you know, my advisor, first of all, and the department um, administration, the head of the department, they were very nice. So I asked them if I could extend it and, you know, under these circumstances and had to get permissions. And since I lived in Dallas and not in in Pittsburgh, there were a couple of classes I still had to take. So I was able to get, um, show them the classes that I wanted to take and get permission to take them in a different city so that it was transferable. So these were all predetermined to take like two external classes. So I took them and finished those. And my advisor, I just had to work out some of the, you know, economics of, you know, funding and stuff. But at that point I'd worked, so I didn't didn't have that many credits left to take in the university. So it was, that made it a bit simpler for me to do. And it's interesting because when I was doing that, So I actually started my PhD program a little before I became a stay-at-home mom. So I was actually, I had a two-year-old at home. Um, I was was expecting my second one and I was working and taking classes. So it was like, my plate was like way overwhelming at that point. So I was like, okay, we need, and we kind of decided that I would probably take a break when when I had kids. So this, at this point, it was like, okay, it's, it's time to take a break. You cannot stretch i mean doing two things itself is hard and this is kind of like three and four things on it so it was a bit much to take on and so i i was able to work it out so if anyone's listening right i think is i think oftentimes we think we can't do it but we should reach out and ask the people so i was able to work out that i would travel i think i only traveled two three times because i had to go for my uh, preliminary presentation and then i had to go for my office my defense and then my graduation and a lot of it was through email and things. And I was collaborating with some other students I hadn't met on some theoretical calculations or reaching out through email and phone calls. So especially with technology, the way it is now, I'm talking about a long time ago, you know, a lot of it can be done virtually and stuff. But it, it also helps to build the connections because I'd already had connections with my 
advisor with the people who are on my committee and things i'd met them before i knew them and i was a grad student and i kept in touch intermittently it had helped to kind of smoothen that thing a bit so no matter what i think those personal connections are important and you know not hesitating to ask for help when you need it of course uh, personal personal relations are very important it's something i try to share all the time and developing your network close network but also wider network is so so important especially for later on for five years from now if you start working on it right away when you start your phd then you have a whole you know garden of 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 relationships that that you can that can be mentors that can you know that can be sounding boards or that can eventually be interested in hiring you in the future but um but here we're still talking about during the phd i i have a, another question so you had a, a two year old you start the program what was your motivation to uh to go into the program what were you seeing you know when i get my degree i will I will what? Was it teaching or were you already looking into industry? So I was already in the industry. So I come of a line, a family line of academics. My father was a faculty. My grandfather was a faculty. My other grandfather was a teacher. So I come from a line of teachers in, in a way. And my sister also was actually graduating with her PhD at the same time. And she was, an acad- she was interested in the academic field. And I did consider it. it. It was at the back of my mind. I had worked in industry, but... When I graduated, I wanted to, I, I did consider, I, I looked for some faculty positions, but really I think industry called to my heart because I'd already worked. I kind of like the fact that I could see the product so quickly and, you know, see that I could um, touch it and feel it kind of different from a research aspect because research is kind of long and um, it's it's a different type of journey. It's a different mindset. And I liked it because actually it's interesting you asked it because when I went back, um, I got called back whether I wanted after my break to see if I wanted to return to TI. And the hiring manager asked me, hey, you've just gotten your PhD. Why are you coming back to work here? Why are you not going into academia? But I think just my mindset, teaching, you know, preparing classes, I think it also intimidated me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if I was able to do that. I, I preferred working in the industry so i decided to go back to what i was doing which is totally natural to to go through those years and starting to see what being a, a professor is and thinking you know what this is not actually what i want to do it's totally natural but the interesting thing is that there what they said what they said to you what they told you was so you did a phd and now you're coming back and it this shows that people on the other side so outside of university are still uh, not seeing that there's a huge pool of PhDs that come out each year and that only 20% become professors and maybe 40-50% stay around academia it, it, it's still the, the public outside still also still has this idea of oh you start a PhD you become a professor and it's an impossibility at least today yeah and that's true because I think most of us who get PhDs, uh, maybe not most, a large percentage of people who get PhDs do not work in the field that they are in, right? I think it's a toolkit. It's a mind, it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. If you ask me what I use for my PhD on a regular basis, it's kind of hard for me to explain. But I think in some ways, maybe the sort of the technical adaptability, the way to pull things together, maybe that comes from it. It's, it's hard for me to differentiate which step of the journey, what I skill I picked up. But it it definitely helps. And you're right. People go, because PhD programs are obviously a narrow focus. That's the whole point of it, right? You you can go into academia and even academics that I know, like friends and colleagues who have, you know, gone into academia, some stay the course. Some have, you know, pivoted and expanded their scope of research into something completely interdisciplinary and new. So they do use all those skills together. And even when you go into industry, some still stay that, you know, that they keep in their focus area, but you just take these skills. And for me, my career has had a lot of pivots, a lot of different uh, groups I've moved in. That's kind of what, looking back, interests me. I like the change of it. So it's it's helped me like, and I and PhD for me also was very personal. I wanted to get it for my own reasons, I guess maybe to prove it for myself. So that was part of the journey as well. Of course. And so now, I have another question that I'll keep for after, but now you you just mentioned that you don't you know you don't exactly use the skills that you developed in your PhD today. What's your can you describe your position, what you do, and what's your day to day in in the industry that you're in? 
Yeah, so I was a TI. I actually just left my job a few months ago, but I was there on and off for about 15 to 17 years. I worked for another company, which was a vendor called Applied Materials. And then I worked at TI for so many years. And I didn't use the technological aspect. Like I worked on magnetic materials. I didn't use that because this was semiconductor stuff. But on a daily basis, so so I'll give you two, three different job descriptions because this is for people who you know might decide to pursue different things. So I worked in the factory in, in engineering roles uh, for a lot of time. And when you're working a manufacturing role, manufacturing in any factories, especially these factories, which are billion dollar investments, have equipment that are in the millions, you know, they're producing uh, any operations, like doesn't matter whether you make a car or you make a little widget. They are turning 24 by 7, right? They have personnel, um, people who operate on, on a shift basis and engineering, which tends to operate on a non-shift basis. So in that, I would, uh, a large part of my engineering was looking at um, data, looking at how the operations are running, like charts and stuff, making sure that they're running. So there's always a sustainability aspect when, when you do these roles, which is making sure everything is running properly and you're trying to optimize the process. There's a troubleshooting aspect, which is where the problem solving comes in, which is kind of fun, sometimes challenging, uh, where you're trying to solve the problem yourself up to a point. But oftentimes you work in teams or groups or there'll be a lot of meetings as well, trying to solve the problem. Maybe maybe this this technology is not yielding and producing what you want it to and you need it to get better or something went wrong and you're trying to fix it. And sometimes there's development as well. You know, you're making changes proactively there's some reactive part of it and then there's some proactive change you're trying to drive either for getting more yield you know reduce cost because it's an operations or you're taking on new technology and you're you know changing or transforming the portfolio so there's all of these pieces happening so that's what I did largely in my engineering role then about a few years later I moved into quality which the role was a bit different as well it it, it so, looks to me that in the engineering role actually is that the is that the the job the job name like engineer or is there if people want to look? Yeah, so I yeah I was called a yield engineer in in a factory. Usually, semiconductor companies have uh, process engineers which work on the process side. Then they have equipment engineers who actually work on the equipment. You know, there's uh, PVD tools, there's photolithography tools. So there's like a lot of different tools. Then the yield engineering and product engineering are other groups which look at the line health and they're looking at it more. Um, because process and equipment are focused on one part of the equipment or the process itself. These people are looking at the whole line health. So there's different things. And I think for people in engineering, and this is true of every job, engineering is every company may or may not have engineering, but there's always, you know, uh, HR, IT, facilities. Th those functions exist. Non-technical functions exist in every organization because you need them F and O you know, finance and operations. These are things that exist in every organization that you do. So when I move to um, quality, quality is uh, oftentimes one of the adjacent organizations that support these kind of factories. So I worked with internal customers, which was the engineering, you know, because now I was sitting in a sort of adjacent organization to solve the problems. We worked with our internal customers also end up being oftentimes uh, in, in a lot of organizations, your business partners and things. And then I worked with external customers as well because I had a huge portfolio of like uh, external customers that we produced products for. So I would work on those. A lot of it was collaboration. A lot of it was trying to understand each one's um, solving the internal problems, solving the external problems and also proactive and reactive, right? There's always going to be a reactive part no matter what job function you have. But as much as it, to move to it proactively, was what my aim was because I tend to lean on the technical aspect, but I also tend to lean a lot on relationship building. And relationship building is not to say, hey, I want to be nice to you. It's, it's by solving the problem. Like here is what we are working on, you know, and uh, bringing people in, stakeholders into the discussion because you need them. Because oftentimes in these kind of roles, like quality and things, you own a part of the problem, but you can't actually go fix it yourself because the engineer still has to work on it. So it's leaning into that and leveraging that so that, and, and I think what is important is when you have these kind of roles is to make sure the other person understands your perspective and what the customers are saying, because oftentimes we might just go and say, fix this, but we don't tell them why and what, and not necessarily the how, but I think once you start showing them what that means, I think then it's, you know, it kind of brings people in and I would do a lot of the proactive building before 
because when a reactive situation hits in my mind you're under too much stress to <laughs> do a good job yeah it, it makes total sense what you say and it, it feels to me like building relationships like you said is not being nice it's bringing value bringing value with creativity in solving problems for other people and it, it, it makes total sense and and then that's how organically your 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 uh, network grows uh now this makes me think of something else because you mentioned 15 ish years of of working in that space uh, or or 17 and you did mention the importance of asking for help uh, and and you know, and I kind of see that as getting mentorship uh, in in graduate school as a woman uh and actually uh, we have in us rf here saying that uh you know, I definitely agree on the importance of networking and asking for help when you need it, especially for women in STEM. And so in in all those years, you know, you had that first conversation with, where, where they said, so you went to do a PhD and now you're coming back to work. How, you know, how was that uh, for you? How, how did those conversations go? How did you make the case of, yes, I'm a woman, yes, I'm actually an, uh, an immigrant coming from India, but yes, I have a place in in this team and in this organization. How did that go for you? I think, and this may be, I'm going to play the dichotomous role, okay? I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I think oftentimes women who pursue STEM careers, we often are the minority, right? Like I interview, I do a radio show. So I interviewed this lady who studied mechanical engineering. She was one out of 70 kids in her class. So I think in some times you, you don't think about it. I didn't think about it so much at work. I know I talk about women in empowerment, but when you're living that experience, sometimes you're not thinking about it, right? It's just the norm. You're used to this thing. I think when you notice it, when there are all women in the room, that's when I noticed it. When I ended up in meetings when I had all women was then you kind of like think about it because usually through school college university you don't tend to have that many there's always like a it's always like that you know 30 30 percent bucket that seems to hit but almost every organization and if they don't have it they have you know employee resource groups and uh, areas around them and the thing is, women need women to support, but you need the men to support them as well. You need allies, you know, you need advisors. And I had incredible uh, mentors, both women and men who, you know, challenged, uh, who pushed, who said, why are you not doing this? So this is the thing, when you have managers who can be what you might consider tough on you, there's two aspects to it. Sometimes they are tough and maybe it's not the most best relationship, but oftentimes when they're tough, they may be challenging you because they think you're capable of doing more. And that's kind of how I tend to look at it. And, and it's something to unwrap, right? They may not say, okay, why did you do this? And they may push you because there's sometimes when they've pushed you and they've come and offered or had conversations about certain opportunities with you and you're hesitant. I tell, especially the women, because research shows that women, if there's a job opening and there are five things, unless all five boxes are ticked, often women don't apply, but men you know, have one and box and they usually apply. So when women are tapped for opportunities, they need to take that opportunity unless there is some extenuating, you know, other circumstances. Don't hesitate to talk, to take the job because of you're not sure you can do it or confidence. The way I look at it is if someone taps you on the shoulder, you obviously have the skills. They think you can do it, which means they're already vested in it. They're going to support you. So I think it's asking for, when I say asking for help, I don't mean to asking for someone to solve your problem. I mean, a lot of the times I did and other people I work with, and then this is my expectation when I work with someone is, I will show you how to do it once, but I expect you to do the work yourself and come to me for help. It is not handholding, right? And then asking a lot of questions. I think no matter which uh, stage you are in your career, especially when you're new, you have to ask questions, a lot of questions. Take notes and ask questions because people want to know that you're hearing them and then you come back and follow up on the conversation. That's how you're going to learn. And there'll be meetings where you'll know nothing and it's okay to ask the question. Maybe you want to think about how you want to frame it so you come out, you know, your presence and your um, sort of personal brand comes out a certain way. But think about it and maybe prep in the beginning for every meeting to see what is the outcome you want. 
because like I said, I was, uh, when I got laid off, actually, when I returned to work, I, I got a call, you know, to come back for one of the roles. And then when I came back, I came back the second time. And on hindsight, I realized there must have been something in the interactions I had that kind of helped happen, that happened, right? So you never know where you're sowing those seeds. Because when I went back to work, one of the times, the call I got was not from somebody I expected. I didn't even know they knew who I was really in the organization. I used to sit in their meetings. They used to be the team leader and, you know, participate. But I was very quiet then. And you never know what seeds you're sowing and what people are taking away. So it is important to ask questions. It's important to engage. And I know a lot of us tend to be introverts. So maybe, you know, find one or two people. I had like one or two engineers who really helped me learn the stuff. You know, I would ask questions and find the right people. Not everyone wants to answer questions. Some people are not willing to engage. So you have to find the right connections to do this. Mm -hmm. And the people who will champion you even where you're not there anymore. And then you get a call. <laughs> exactly. And those are the people. And you're never going to know who they are. Not necessarily. I mean, you can cultivate them. And you can do your due diligence. And sometimes you'll find out who they are. And sometimes you may not know. And you'll be surprised by who will do it also. So. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I guess I guess what you're saying is we che once you're in an organization, whichever professional interactions you have within the organization, try to always bring some value to the table. And and because you're those are the seeds that you that you're uh, that you're sowing and that eventually will will give fruit, be it like like what happened to you or being tapped for a promotion or 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 you know or or for being invited into another department because they feel that you're a great you know that would be you'll be a great uh, addition to their team uh, it makes total total sense to me so we have mentioned this part of, of about kind of mentorship and and which is interesting because the way you put it is b you didn't you didn't say go get a mentor what you kind of said, and I'm going to distill it in a few words, is be a mentee. And and why I'm saying that is ask the questions. You know, be be on the on the floor, try to 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 solve uh, solve problems. But you know, ask from your superior, from your from the person who knows more, and and interact with them in that way. And by acting as a mentee, I feel like organically mentors will come out of the woodwork and and kind of take that uh, that mental yeah that's partly true you will see mentorship is is so many things right and i urge everyone to get a mentor you have to so mentorship can be an infinitesimal meetup we think of it as this grand thing with a title and everything which 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 you will have like i have mentors who i've had for years now and it started with uh, seeing them in one of these forums I, I i a lot of it was also through my women's erg forums so i met somebody i'd gotten a role and asked them you know if i could talk to them to get some help and insight on how i should you know step into these kind of roles they weren't in my organization they were very many levels up but you know that started that way and once we established uh, mentorships are also a lot of trust right you you are opening up to someone you have to maintain confidentiality you know and it it not all of them gel the first time. So it, it's, you know, your different personality. So I've had some mentors for seven, eight years now, and we have moved on and stuff. And we've, we've talked about it. But there might be the person you might have an interaction only two times, but they might give you something. Sometimes it might be someone who's, you know, newer than you or junior to you, especially with the way technology is changing now. They may end up mentoring you. Like, I lean into people to show me social media because I have no idea about it. So, you know, I'm getting mentored by people, young people like my niece to show me how do I do social media and what to do about it. So, And you're getting mentorship from but, her? <laughs> exactly. And everybody needs a mentor because I, I've i done a whole season talking about mentorship and how to establish a relationship and do that. And I realized that when I talk to people oftentimes we've had it maybe when we were in school then a decade went by and we didn't even think about it and and the reason is it gives you someone to talk to who might look at where you can aspire to and give you some guidance and and the other thing i would take it even a step further is to build a board of advisors or a board of directors like like a company builds 
And they can be in your career, they can be in your financial life, they can be there. And these are people who will come, some will stay on it, some just like a board will stay and, you know, will exit it at a different point. And for you to leverage, who would you call for certain questions? Because I've been pivoting and, you know, for different things, I call different people, some are sounding boards. So I would say take some time and establish it because life will just happen and flow by and it's very hard. We're all constrained for time, so we have to think about how to do it. So what I'll do also, now that you say this, is I'll ask for some links of uh, episodes uh, from your series on mentorship, because this is something that interests me a lot, and I know that it'll interest the, the Beyond the Thesis audience. Now, thinking about this, this experience of being helped, being mentored by other people, to and finding kind of your, the, your way to be present in the organization that you were in, that that you de- developed throughout the years thinking of women who are now entering their their first positions in an organization what would you say were because you mentioned you said someone like you know someone tells you oh why why are you not doing this or that what were things at the beginning that you were not doing that you learned from these people uh, and that helped you grow your career grow your confidence and grow your your uh, your independence in a way professionally and yeah, it's it's been a journey, right? I think when you come as an immigrant or when you come cultural differences, the cultures that, that I come from, you know, you don't, I guess, talk about yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's very different in the US. You have to speak about yourself, which is very hard to do it in a sort of tasteful way. <laughs> Especially for women, there's, it's, it's even more harder because... Um, you know, you you can be, there's this cartoon that, that I have, someone sent me, and there's two women are talking. Uh, I, I'll come back to your question, but the reason I want to state this is there are two women, you know, typing on their computer, facing away from each other. And one asks, what's the difference between aggressive and assertive? And the other one, without looking back, says gender. So, and and it is something that women struggle with. You know, and even we may do the judging ourselves or amongst other women. So it's very care. It's very hard. You walk a very fine line between being vocal and not vocal and being heard. So there's all this background noise that happens. But the way I'd say for someone, if, if I were to do it now again, right, and this is what I would tell someone, when you're stepping into a job, there's so many things, you know, you know, take some time, um, figure out what the job is. but in the first few weeks, I would meet with the manager, find out how the organization is set up, meet the team members, you know, figure out what they are, what do they do, learn from them, you know, maybe they have training documents, find out what your role is about, and get as much absorption as you can, spend time learning it. And the reason I say take notes is because sometimes you'll meet people who will have these conversations, but they may not have taken notes, and they you know, often come back for the same thing. Then you kind of start to lose the credibility and people will lose interest in having that conversation because you're you're coming back to the same thing. And set up a one-on-one with your boss every two weeks at least, if not once a week. And find out what it is and follow up that conversation. Take notes of what you have done. And performance reviews happen in every organization once a year, maybe twice a year, like on a six month. But really, if you're having a career conversation and start them early, right? If, if you're listening to this, you're already ahead of the curve. Most of us don't realize till five years in what we want to do. But if you're listening to something like this podcast and on, on his other, on Papa PhD's, David's other episodes, start thinking about what you want to do. And you can change your mind at any point of time. It doesn't mean you have to stick to the whole path, but find out what do they have? Do they have technical pathways? Do they have managerial pathways? There are certain projects or I like this group. A lot of organizations now have rotation programs because, you know, so they move them in different groups and you get experience and start doing projects, diving into things, learning from it, engaging in meetings. And if you don't know um, and you're not don't want to speak up in the meeting when you don't know anything, meet with the people who are organizing it or something outside of it. Learn a little bit, do some research and step in and ask questions. When you ask questions, try to see if you can have a solution because it's not always about stating a problem. People can state it, but they want someone who can also help provide a way to think. And it's okay to have a different way of thinking about it. That's what drives innovative solutions. Mm -hmm, Of course. It's interesting because all that you've just said in the last uh, 
couple of minutes could also totally apply to going through grad school <laughs> completely you know take part in meetings uh, talk with the people who are organizing them try to make yourself useful in other groups etc but uh but uh it, coming back to our context uh, it's just interesting to me because it was just you know i was just making these connections but um it's uh it feels to me like a lot of what you're saying revolves around uh, in the end, human relationships and and conversations, uh, productive conversations, not just uh, chewing the fat, but taking w- when you're vocal, when you raise your voice, uh, be, you know, being sure that you're, like you said, bringing a solution and and uh, helping someone, even if they're not your direct colleague or or they're not in your department, um, because. It's interesting. You also mentioned mentioned the rotations, which I think is a, is a cool model for onboarding people. Um, but it, it looks, uh, from what I've he- you know heard in other conversations, that modern organizations are actually pretty open to you evolving within the organization, not only linearly, but also you know horizontally, you know, in changing groups or changing um, changing. Um, responsibilities uh depending on your interests on like you said the solutions that you bring and and kind of the the color you bring to your interactions is that something that you that you experience this kind of flexibility of of designing a career path within an organization yeah so i'll start back actually i'll I'll lean into mentorship so when I first found a mentor, it was through a formal program, like, you know, one of the ERG diversity initiatives had a mentoring program. So I was able to find one. And she introduced me to this concept called informational interviews, this mentor I had. So so you're absolutely right. Whatever we were talking about could be done, done during your thesis, right? Especially when people are doing a PhD. I didn't do it as much, but maybe on hindsight, maybe it also was the transition from country to country. My advisor was nice about sending us to conferences and, you know, putting us in like um, the society of women in all of these sigma side, these these technical organizations. So people should be part of their professional organization. It's society of women engineers, mechanical, whatever it is. Start being active in them. Take a leadership role because it gives you access to people. It gives you access to opportunities or projects or ideas. I mean, even if you're technical, you still need access. If if you think, oh, I don't want to do the personal side, it sounds very non, you know, sort of not sticky enough. You still need access. Otherwise, you're not going to get the project you want to work on. So she, so the way she did it is she introduced me to the first person and she made me prepare a slide on what, who I was and what I did. And when I met the first person, I would talk to them. So this is, I did this for a year after I came back to work when I was a stay-at-home mom because I knew I wanted to transition to another role in the company. And that time, that time rotation programs and all didn't really exist. You know, this rotation program, I think most companies have done it sort of only in the last few years, just as a cultural shift. So I had to kind of, you know, figure out what I wanted to do. So I would meet with somebody. I would send, I, I always send people a calendar invite. I never send them an email because we get hundreds of emails and we never see them. <laughs> it's true. So I would put a, I would put a calendar invite for 30 minutes and say, hey, this is who I am. I want to talk to you about this. Sometimes they may have job openings, which I may or may or not, but I would still wanted to talk. And maybe 30 minutes an hour before I would send them a slide or a resume. And then go and talk to them and say, hey, this is who I am. Ask them about their role. What do their organization do? So I would talk to, I was an engineer. I would talk to planning, marketing, oh God, systems, application, you know, everybody, sales, you know, all sorts of groups because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I wanted to find out what the roles were. And every time I ended a conversation, depending on how it went, you know, if it went really well, I would ask two things. One is if they needed help. Though I know, because sometimes they may not understand how a factory works. So it could be something simple, right? Or, you know, you could help them with a connection or something. And then the second thing I would ask is if they suggest who else I talk to. So that's how you kind of build on it. So then they would give me the next person. And if it went well, I would ask if they would give me an introduction. So they may introduce me to somebody. And sort of then by the time you have the third conversation, say I'm with marketing, you know some of the lingo now. And so you can leverage that lingo to have a conversation. And by then I had a grid map of, you know, which roles I wanted to do and which roles I didn't want to do. So it kind of helped me focus on it. So that's sort of a skill. If a rotation program does not exist in your organization, or even if you want to pivot your career, you want to change industries, whatever. I think that that technique, that 
you know, kind of my mentor showed me, I think can be leveraged in any forum. If you're coming back to work after a break, you could do that because the landscape has changed. You need to sort of re-energize your connections. Start doing that and figuring out what you want to do. I love it. Uh, yeah, information, informational interviews, I think, are key uh, in in actually making sense of your, or your career journey and laying laying the, the the foundations for what's the next chapter because there's always a next chapter and uh, if you know the terrain it's much easier to navigate than just saying okay now i'm leaving and now i have to scramble and find you know get be- you know find my bearings etc so I, I really really like it but i also like the your approach of kind of then treating those that data kind of as a as a scientist right of having a grid and having a which is uh, it's very uh, uh it's very um on on character for a phd <laughs> to do to do that to do that to take that approach um but yeah i uh, so i think this is for me one of the nuggets of uh, of these conversations that i want people to take home is having a structured way and you know informational interviews are a structured way of having conversations that are, that are um that have a sense, that have a kind of an, an objective, although they're not transactional, uh, I think are, is key for anyone, but in particular, and, and even more for women who want to to uh, to be very strategic and, and to build their career in a very intent, in a very, you know, thought, uh, uh, thought through way. Yeah, and, and you're right. I think that I like the, that you picked the word transactional because... You know, when I've had conversations, when I, I did a LinkedIn Live called Expanding Your Network, I realized that people's hesitancy around networking is the transactional basis. And it's not about being transactional. Actually, it's completely the opposite. It's about building a relationship. Either you have a common thread. Okay, we are both podcasters and, you know, we both obviously are interested in the PhD part of it. So that is something that connects us, right? So you'll always find a common ground somewhere. Or maybe you haven't found it and that's what you're exploring and almost everybody is willing to help you. So you have to kind of think about how to leverage because you have to give back. Even for a mentor-mentee relationship, you have to give back to your mentor. It could be suggesting something that they have not seen, maybe a technology. Like to my mentor, I'm sharing, you know, this is, hey, this is this thing I saw. I thought this might be of interest to you. You know, maybe there are these roles that I think you would be great for. So there are things you can do uh, about it as well. Yeah. Sadisha, we're reaching the end of the interview. Uh, before we we go on and, and try to to have a, a little sum up and a, a last uh, take home message for for people watching or for the listeners, can you please share where people can find you? I have for people watching, I have some contacts going going uh, here in the bottom of the screen, but um, for those who are going to be just listening in the podcast. If if they want to learn a little bit more about you, if they have some specific questions they want to ask you, how is the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. That's really the best place to reach me, you know, connect with me on that, Sarisha Kuchimanchi. I do spend some time on Instagram. Those sort of are my two platforms, so Women, Career, and Life. But like David said, you know, I have a podcast, women career and life so take a listen some of the topics that we talked about i do talk about it there i talk about a lot around women and leadership and things but it's interesting i find um, though my podcast is called women career and life about 30 percent of the listeners at least through spotify says that are men listening to it because because the topics you know still apply to them i mean it's still about leadership and feedback and conversations with your boss and whatever else might might be the way to go forward so LinkedIn is, is I guess, my sweet spot to end up listening to me. Excellent. No, and it make, it makes total sense that that thirty percent of men listen. And because if you if you we go back to the beginning of our conversation, and it, at a certain point you mentioned that you know in the culture where I come from, it's not well uh, perceived to talk about yourself, right? In the same way, uh, people in the in the the job market. In, are not all you know americans or canadians i come from portugal people come from all over the world from cultures where i don't know uh, re- uh the relationship with authority is difficult or you know not so easy talking talking about yourself also there's a lot of cultures where it's frowned upon and uh 
and you can be a man coming from such a culture and kind of identify and be interested in in hearing these conversations that are happening on uh women career and life on your podcast I, it makes total sense to me <laughs> yeah exactly and you you bring up the cultural aspect right because there is you know when i talk to people from latin america from africa from different parts there's a lot of overlap on how people show up so uh, you know southeast asia south asia and stuff and you know some structures are very hierarchical also right so you you're not going to bypass the hierarchy while in the us culture you you can tend to bypass the hi- hierarchy because there's open door policy so i always urge people to you know have a conversation or call skip level you know one level up your boss and meet with them as well so from a cultural context i that's why to address that i wanted i sort of started sahita which is like the south asian community for women because for career and finances because as women at least in my personal experience and conversations i have we manage our careers you know we may be doing great but sometimes we don't always manage our finances and i think it's important to sync them up because we need to have that sort of financial independence it's not about you know changing the dynamics at home so much but you need to be aware right because life happens and just like i talked about proactive and reactive at work you cannot you have to be proactive you can't when life happens it's too reactive and too stressful to make changes then yes. <laughs> and it's true it's better to be prepared and proactive than yeah than scrambling kind of like i said too for careers than just scrambling at the last minute to figure out what's the next step uh, i i totally totally agree Trisha, looking back at our conversation and, and it's funny i i'm kind of really actually going to kind of rewind in a certain way it we, we ended up in uh, uh, talking about informational interviews and how they were key and 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 you know instrumental in having you figure out where you wanted to go and taking the right decisions and and then to be able to change uh your career path into something that you'd liked better where you'd be, you'd show up you know uh, in a in a more productive way let's say because when you were doing what we like we we were better at what we do um and it feels to me like again like re- rewinding a little bit all of our conversation if there's one line even going going until the the the, the informational interview there's one uh, kind of silver lining to me there's one line one uh, uh, i don't you know one thread that that i that i think goes through everything which is communicating and and having productive conversations with people around you so if you are you know when you're an immigrant when you are uh, just a, being a woman you can uh, tend to uh, isolate yourself or not speak up uh, and it feels like you're you know allowing yourself to have a voice and then practicing also how to and this is where we go back to informational interviews practicing this voice practicing learning new lingo etc cetera, etc cetera, i think it kind of it's a thread that goes through the whole uh the whole conversation that we had but and of course conversations means not only your voice but it means the, the people you are talking with and this is where where we go back to mentorship and uh, and kind of um this kind of mentee mentor relationship where you need to be able to ask questions when you need to ask questions being open to learn even from people who are younger or uh you know who are who had, don't have a degree if you do have a degree um so it, it really it really feels to me like and it's interesting that we're both podcasters but it feels to me that a lot a lot of um a big part of uh navigating career is finding your voice and nurturing your voice and and, and your voice in the professional setting, right? And, and um, kind of shaping it to a way that works for you, but that also that works for people listening to you, be they managers, be they people on the on the factory floor. Uh, I, I don't know if you have a last reflection on that and, uh, and the last word for young researchers who are considering doing the leap to industry and who are maybe a little bit afraid of it. Uh, you said it so beautifully. I, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to add to what you just said, but I, I, I mean, just to reinforce the message, right? 
whether you're in academia, whether you venture out to be an entrepreneur, whether you work in industry, because, you know, I did research, then I was in industry, I'm, you know, on my pathway to an entrepreneurship journey, you have to find that voice. And it doesn't mean the same that someone else shows up, right? And it, it's an evolving journey. Who I am today wasn't how I spoke five years ago. So and won't be probably five years from now. And finding that and and being intentional about the conversations. When people think of networking, you know, sort of being relationship building, I do want to reiterate, especially because we are talking to a largely sort of technical population if they're doing PhD in whichever field, it is about leaning into your technical knowledge, not giving up the core of who you are. It's not about, you know, having like hang out with your buddies and a happy hour. That's not what we are meaning. We are meaning technical relationships. It could be other things. It is important because you all have to solve problems collectively. Rarely is a problem solved on your own, either to understand it, to reach it. So I would say start asking questions, building those. And I, I keep going back to that and, and looking for mentors at different points because I had one in grad school through the graduate school program. And I remember, I, I wish I remember the lady's name because I would love to thank her again. She worked on the Hubble telescope in NASA which I thought was the coolest thing then. And I still think is. So, you know, I've had a lot of people along the way who have helped ask questions. And my questions to her at that point were non-technical. I asked her about how do you manage family? How do you manage kids? You know, how, what do I do if both of us have PhDs? How do we find jobs? Because that's another thing that people wonder, right? How do you both find? Because it's it narrows your scope. So asking people questions, you never know where the answer will come from. Thank you. Sarisha, this has been great. Uh, it's it's been really a pleasure uh, having this conversation with you. I, I really like the where we went with the conversation, uh, and uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, helpful to a lot of people out there, be they women or not. Um, and yeah, I I, I want to commend you for all the work you're you're putting into having these platforms uh, and and you know including radio, podcast, and this community. So yeah, for for anyone listening, find Sarisha if you if you're interested in in asking some more questions on LinkedIn, um, and um, and yeah, and even if it's just to thank her for this hour almost that that we spent here talking about this. So Sarisha, thank you so much for having accepted my invitation and for having been on Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. Thank you, David. This has been a fantastic conversation and I'm always game to connect with people. So reach out to me if they want to have questions too. Thank you for listening to another episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. If this conversation has helped you somehow, if you know someone who has a great story to share on the show, or if you yourself have a story you'd like to share with me on Beyond the Thesis, Send me a note to listener at papaphd.com. I'm always happy to connect with listeners like you. If you want to support me in creating the podcast in any other way, you can go to papaphd.com forward slash support and choose whichever way works best for you. I am David Mendez. See you next week.